Okay, so welcome everyone. Please take your seat, grab your last drink. Okay, and uh, before we start with the uh, welcoming words from um, our um, yeah, co-director and from IBM, uh, we want to show you a very short uh, video to kind of set the mood for this evening. So enjoy. Okay, welcome everybody. I hope you're all uh, in the right mood to talk to uh, talk about a really great topic tonight. So my name is Thomas. Uh, I'm the co-director and co-founder of TechBuddy. I'm really happy to see that many faces here. Um, I think it's quite a lot of new faces here. So who of you has been to TechBuddy here before? Okay, the other way around. Who hasn't been here? Almost half. Who knows what we do? <laughs> who doesn't know what we do? Okay, so it's worthwhile to spend one or two sentences on what we actually do. So we are quite young. Um, we're not uh, old, right? Um, not in terms of me as a person, but as a company. And we are here to really strengthen the entire technology and innovation and startup scene uh, in the entire region. Um, we offer space, that's the one thing, but we also offer a lot of programs. We have a lot of startups, more than 100 startups in our network, and a huge corporate partner base, among others, uh, IBM as a recent partner that, you, that joined us for a lot of different topics. And what we mainly do is we connect the different players of the ecosystem, saying that a lot of the startups come together with the banks, but not just the banks, now technology providers, the public government, the universities, and all of them have one goal, collaborate, with the aim to really facilitate and able to innovate and act entrepreneurial. And this is what we do. We are an innovation platform. And tonight is, uh, I would say, really a special night. Like half a year ago, um, we kicked off our AI initiative, where we said uh, in Hessen there needs to be more activity with regards to artificial intelligence. And uh, this is an event series that we did set up with IBM. It's not the very first event that we do. We had a program, we had 10 fintechs that focused on AI here in November last year. There have been some programs, but with you as a very strong partner now with IBM, we can really strengthen that topic and run events, a series, always on the topic of AI to really focus on a specific topic that will touch us, I think, all or already touches us, uh, and this is what we want to discuss tonight, and we as TechWatier, we want to function as a facilitator to kind of give you the access to the startups, to the different players in the, not just region, but every, uh, actually all around uh, the, the entire country, and see how AI is actually done and how we can actually apply it, and we're really happy to do that with you uh, as a partner. And yeah, you just joined, and it's the second event that we actually do with you. But yeah, that's true. <laughs> perhaps you want to say one or two sentences as well, Dilek. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much, very much for being here tonight and for co-hosting the AI event series. Yeah, thank you for being here. So a warm welcome also from my side. It's really a pleasure and be a honor to be here. We had already a meetup together in February where we have focused on banking. Um, and we are hopefully doing also some meetups, but this is uh, the first event of uh, a lot of events. And uh, I think the most of you are knowing IBM, uh, but the most of you are knowing 
I guess IBM for uh, from the past and we are having also a digital future I'm saying always and one part of this is working with companies like Tech Quartier together to go more into the startup area also to go more into that uh, space with young people in getting connections doing new things this is also why we are doing a lot of meetups um, uh, but uh, we found in Tech Quartier really a good um, partner with whom we could work to connect with all of you. Yeah? And uh, I think everybody who is knowing IBM is knowing maybe we are doing big events and sometimes it's not easy to cooperate with us. But we found new ways and this is one of these ways and I'm really, really happy to be here and uh, to host this event. You will hear uh, later also a pitch of me. I will be also part of the panel discussion. So we will have a lot of really great uh, subjects here and I'm really happy that we have you as Tech Quartier as a partner. And it goes the other way around. So thank you very much. And uh, I think that deserves an applause that IBM supports the <laughs> startup and innovation scene here. Actually, how many startups do we have? Who's a startup here? We have some of, oh, that, that's quite great. Who, who's a startup that focuses or has something to do with AI? I know that a lot of startups say, I'm an AI startup, but who really does AI? Okay. Who's an AI, AI expert? Some of you, very good, very good. So after tonight, all of you are going to be experts. Now let's see if we can keep that promise. So really great that you're all here, and now I hand over to Alina. Thanks for setting this all up, Alina. And uh, yeah, you're going to be the moderator tonight, and let us know what's going to happen. Yeah, so actually I noticed I didn't introduce myself. So yeah, I'm Alina. I'm uh, leading the events and programs team here at uh, Tech Quartier. And I'm happy that so many of you uh, showed up. Feel free to get up and get a drink during the event. It's a uh, very easygoing atmosphere. Um, yeah, and with uh, no further delay, um, I want to introduce our first and, uh, well, the main keynote speaker tonight. Um, it's actually hard to put in a nutshell what he does because he does so much. Um, just to name a few things, uh, he's a deep tech leader, consultant and manager with special interest in artificial intelligence, of course, cognitive sciences, data science and deep learning. He's a long-time startupper and CTO, a lecturer in applied uh, artificial intelligence and tech leadership, and also a public speaker with interest in Buddhist studies, which I found very interesting. So his motto is, mind is my vocation, and uh, give him a big applause, Levente. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you very much. I've been told that I have 30, se 30 minutes to make you an expert in AI, so that's, that's the challenge for tonight, tonight evening. I don't promise that I would succeed. What I will try is to give you a bit of a glimpse of what I feel are the, the current trends. So why are we here at all? Why is this whole topic of AI so relevant now? And I will try to give some hints on the application side, like more the society side, that I think we, with the colleagues, started already to discuss a bit about what implications that might have from our lives. So let's go ahead. Uh, yeah. I, you already know me, uh, if anyone wants to hit me up, I most probably think that you will get the slides. I put some links over there in everywhere, so if you want to study the certain subjects further, please feel free to reach out and read the things. So, first and foremost, what we don't want to talk about is, is this. Okay, just, just to get, get it clear. So what we are not talking about is this, n n no, no Terminator. That's, that's kind of a baseline one. So the big question is if not Terminator, so not the general intelligence, not the life-threatening scenarios that we see on TV, now what, what are we talking about? Well, basically what we are talking about is things that we don't really experience as that revolutionary, but they are deployed. They are out there. We just use some chatbots, and when I want to go from New York to Seattle, I can try to interact with an intelligent agent and try to book my flights accordingly. Or if I just walk around in the underground and I take the underground, so the subway basically, then most possibly I'm under surveillance of a CCTV camera, which is possibly analyzing my face and having some nice clues whether I'm male or female or who I am or where I'm going. 
almost possibly there are super mundane tasks like sorting tomatoes and no one would think that there is an AI application for sorting tomatoes and there you have it. There is a thing which is having a quick falling through tomatoes and the only goal of the thing is to kick out the unripe tomatoes. First and foremost, what's already visible is not perfect. It's super not perfect, but just imagine if you wanted to hire 10 people to, to pick these uh, tomatoes out of the, the bunch, it wouldn't be that effective. So yes, these are systems which are all around us. The question is, how did we get there? How, how did we get to this point that we have this pervasive technology and we don't e really even know about it consciously that much? So, three things I want to talk to you about. One is the technology part. The second is, non-surprisingly, the business applications. But I think maybe the more challenging will be, and that's what the discussion will lead us to, is the societal implications. Let's just go ahead. First and foremost, that is AI in its original form. The guys uh, inventing, yeah, absolutely, this guy is Frank Rosenblatt, and when, when he uh, started to learn with, with perceptrons, I, I mean, I love the hardware. So just, just think about it. That, that is really cool hardware. My geek heart is like pounding. It's uh, absolutely horrific. Uh, 1955, the orig original of the term of artificial intelligence, there was a summer school in Dartmouth trying to come together between linguistics and computer scientists and some even electrical engineers and come up with some methodologies that will enable the modeling of certain functions of intelligence. The certain functions will be the, the changing variables through time, but now here the other way around, we see an, a mature Go player being be beaten very hard by uh, an AI, so this is this funny transition and that's what we have to understand. I encourage you to uh, listen to this video. We don't have to have the time for it because nearly half an hour, but in it's, it's from the 1960s where they talk about the revolution that's happening in AI. It's nearly there. I mean, in five or ten years, says Claude Shannon, by the way, uh, who, who kind of inf invented IT as such in certain cases. So these guys are seriously telling us that in eight years, the machines will run around. They will just talk and be intelligent and everything, and all this in black and white TV. So that's very funny, in a sense. Uh, and just, we are in 2019 and it didn't happen. So what? Turns out to be that the original uh, impetus or the original run that people started to solve problems was majorly overestimating our capabilities and thought about specialist knowledge. Like if, you, if I can do a chess machine, you know chess is very, very difficult to learn. If I can do a chess machine, then I grasp something about intelligence. Turns out to be that it's easier to do a chess machine than something that can go down the stairs. So much of the things that we humanly do as, as a natural activity, that is, is super hard to model. Whereas a very complicated numeric problem turned out to be very modelable. So this kind of shifted the problem understanding very strongly. And this is what happened. It happened that uh, till the 60s, late 60s, the uh, paradigm, the then, then this Rosenbach paradigm with the wires was gaining traction. And then people said, OK, this is, this is not going to work. Everything collapsed. And then another paradigm started to emerge. There was funding in it. Everyone was hoping that now, in five years, the, s the machines will, will run around. And then it collapsed again. So there is always this cycle, which is called AI winters. Like, AI winter is always the overpromise disillusionment, overpromise disillusionment type of thing. So if I would be very mean to you, I would say that we are just now overpromising. And in two years, I won't be at stage. You will be at home, and there will be no AI. Hmm. Uh, let me formulate a bit more positively, OK? Th what happens is that, that something really happened. This is no longer the hype cycle. This is the performance cycle. Performance meaning that this graph is showing the capability of a machine to trans transcribe text. So if you would connect the thing that I'm speaking into to a machine, for example, you, you have these kind of solutions, that how much of the text is being accurately translated to text. Well, if you look at it, the traditional, th there was always a kind of gradual improvement. It was 60% not enough, 65% still not enough, 75% still not enough. And then something happens in 2012. 
namely this. Something happens, and this something is the current paradigm of deep learning, whereby it's no longer the factor that you take 200 more engineers to get 2% better. Maybe, and this is the promise that's happening now, is that you can get 200 more times data and get better with the same amount of engineers. So this is, I think, one of the graphs which, are, which is proving that maybe we are not looking at a hype. We are looking at something that is pretty close to human performance. In fact, in this special task, human performance has been beaten two and a half years ago. So now it's, vo it's the, the voice that I put in here is better translated by a machine than by a human to characters. So I, I would argue that there is really something happening here. In certain cases, we are no longer that effective. We are no longer the dominating cognitive agent. That's interesting to think about that. But what happened? Why, why, why is this? There were some technical, small technicalities. Some of the, the godfathers of deep learning always says that, yeah, we did some bunch of development. That's, some I mean, 200 people's PhDs. So not that bunch of development. But basically what changed from the 1950s is not just the fact that we are no longer putting wires in a cupboard to simulate a computer, uh, but that also, is that we changed the units that comprise these neural type of architectures. So we are putting in different units. There was some innovation. We train them differently. We use way more data. And I think that is one of the interesting parts, is that with all these technical developments, the three pillars that are happening here is, yes, techniques, but also something that the techniques can apply to, the fact that we have enough data. The fact that we no longer train everything on tens or hundreds or even thousands or ten thousands of images, but millions, ten millions, billions of images. This in itself was one of the keys that of, for performance. But on the other hand, okay, I mean, you want to train on ten million images, but you have uh, your personal computer for that. I mean, uh, maybe not, that's, that's not that a good idea. So yes, the computational power and the computational power that is available to us on demand, that is the other thing. So the whole revolution we are sitting in is not just an isolated revolution of very clever people coming up with the new ideas. No, these people are having raw material to work from and machinery that can apply this, these ideas to something. And now try to, I, I, I try to guess, do the guesswork. You know, every consultant has to do some magic and try to predict the future, and it never happens. So bear with me. Maybe it's interesting to, to see what my predictions are, where we will be going in a couple of weeks or a couple of years. So what will be the next step in this revolution? Well, first and foremost, I think we will be better at doing the same thing. Doing the same thing like better image recognition, better speech recognition, better language processing, and so on. Better meaning that this is one of the results coming from one and a half years ago. One trick that people found out was able to, uh, to be utilized in training neural networks in, in a very effective way. Efficiency gain was eight folds. So whereas it took one week to train uh, an image classifier, it became one day, or less than one day. So there is something in the air that people are trying to optimize that we already know. There is performance gain in, in computation. We will be, we will be quicker, quicker to do the same things. Maybe, and that's another uh, more recent paper, we will be able to figure out the right data to use. Maybe we don't need all the 10 gazillion Instagram photos of giraffes just to figure out what a giraffe is. Maybe it, it's, it's good that we have three prototypical giraffes and we can learn from it. I mean, a human can. A human can figure out things like when we had this discussion, like children can figure out very easily certain things from two examples, not a couple of millions. So what, what we are heading uh, towards is trying to make it so-called sample efficiency so that we n have much data, but we shouldn't need that much to, tra to train these systems. That's also coming up. And third is that maybe these huge robust models that we use with requiring huge servers to train on are an overkill. 
This paper is uh, a very recent paper, less than four months old, and they argue that all the machinery that we apply brute force is maybe kind of unnecessary. Maybe we could come, uh, come up with very nimble, small models that would accomplish the same accuracy in transcribing my voice and not brutalizing everything with huge server farms. So I think the next trend will be doing it quicker, smaller, more effective. But basically the same thing. This is kind of boring, isn't it? Let's, let's look into something what, what's more interesting, maybe. What else can we do? OK, we can predict whether there is a giraffe in a picture. Well, we, did they did attack my face in the CCTV camera? OK, this is super boring. But what if, ooh, where is my slide? So if there would be a slide, we would see <laughs> <laughs> a, an evil, evil AA is playing tricks on me. You see, it's sabotaging my slides. No. So the slide was about generating images. So we are trying to come up with models that are no longer just trained on binary. This is a giraffe, this is not. This is class A, this is class B. This is John, this is not John. But trying to capture something in general about the distribution of faces. So what if we could come up with models that understand what a human face is, meaning that ah, it requires two ears, and when I look from this direction, I only see one ear, but there should be another one somewhere, isn't it? On the, on the, on the other side, okay, let's rotate it. Ah, there you go, there is another ear. So something generally, but these models which are, are good at understanding the underlying relationships of things, which can be tested, for example, with generating new faces. Uh, I highly recommend you. There is a website. It's called thispersondoesn'texist.com. If you just navigate there, it will generate a very lifelike person who never existed. It's just generated from a model, since the model understood what a face means. I mean, it need, needs facial hair, it needs eyes, it needs whatnot, and it's able to generate very convincing fake people. Think about the applications in politics. Okay, what else? There is a rise on, uh, of, of game-playing AI solutions. This is Dota 2, one of the favorite multiplayer uh, games online. But I think what's very interesting is that though we can beat uh, Dota 2, we can do StarCraft, we can do Go, we can do all these games, but real life examples of deploying this technology are very rare. I only know one or two yet. So what will surely come is that the playing field will shift. It won't be just the playing field for online games or poker or Go or whatnot. It will be the playing field of cell towers, of rail equipment, of things that we really actively use that will be controlled or, for example, the, tr the timing of traffic lights inside a city classical problems which can be tackled with this kind of model. So more and more we will see, or won't see, because we won't actively understand that the cell phone tower was tilted because an AI was, was working on it. Ericsson is working on this technology to automatically calibrate the cell phone towers. But all these game-playing things are not interesting by themselves, but this will be the gaming field. And then it gets more interesting, I think. And more and more what's happening is that the things that we know and we're able to encode our knowledge in things, something like Wikipedia or something like structured knowledge that we were able to, to use, we had a very hard time utilizing our own humanly readable knowledge and feeding it into these models. That was kind of borderline impossible since a year ago or so. Now people are experimenting in trying to come up with humanly understandable knowledge that I can describe and try to put these descriptions somehow into the models which are acting as black boxes. So these funny pattern recognizer engines should be able to learn something from our human, human capacity and structured knowledge. If someone from the tech side is interested, there are some papers which you can look up, which are really in pointing into this direction. So summarizingly, what will come up? There will be most possibly optimizing or game-playing agents affecting parts of our environment. We will try to push more of our knowledge into these models, and hopefully they will understand a bit more generally, not just giraffe and non-giraffe, but something about at least animal, please. 
So, but what happens with business? I mean, okay, let's assume that now a cell phone tower is tilting mechanics and the traffic lights you travel by are controlled by AI. Okay, but what is the business in this whole thing? Why, why, why is this profitable? Who is interested in this? And, and anyhow, why, why do we do this innovation at all? Well, there is a guy who had the very lucky fortune to sit by the AI revolution, but he was at the other department. He's an economist. He was physically located at the same University of Toronto where the people did this big deep learning innovation, but he was not sitting at the <laughs> information technology department. He was always like looking at, the, yeah, they are doing something interesting. Very funny people. They did, he did as this for 20 years, and he had good working relationship with these people. And after a while, he dared to grab a cafe with them and ask them, OK, good. Let's talk about business. I understand that you have these funny magic boxes. I don't really care about how they do what they do. How do you make money of that? That was the question. And he came up with, a, with some thinking about it. He also wrote a book, which I highly, highly recommend. So you might be interested in reading that. But the main thesis of this gentleman is that there are basically, when we talk about current AI or machine learning, if we are al allergic to AI as a, as a terminus, then what we are s uh, saying is that we are having uh, the ability to do prediction very cheaply. We can look at data that we don't know much about, and very cheaply, we can figure out something about it. If something as a new technology is very cheap, what do we do with it? Well, we use more of it, since it's cheap, isn't that? If I can figure out things from data very, very effectively with a low cost, I will try to figure out everything what I can from every data that I can reach and try to recast these problems, uh, what I face in, in my life, to data problems. Who would have thought that driving to Munich is a data problem? It is. I mean, you have a human behavior, and optimally, if there would be a system that would predict that I will push the brakes, it could push the brake instead of me, isn't that? If it could predict that there will be a guy coming from that bicycle and going across me, if the prediction is good enough, most possibly he will be able to steer in the right direction and won't hit the guy. So if you look at it technically, you can reformulate much of our business problems into partial prediction problems. So if I can predict that someone will buy, for example, the newest t-shirt that I'm selling, sometimes it's easier to just ship them the t-shirt. When I'm so right, why not? And this is actively something that is happening. It's happening, which is, in Amazon's case, I think this is more, more interesting. In Amazon's case, there is a, a thing called predictive shipment. Meaning that we no longer act on the understanding that, oh, Levante is ordering a t-shirt. OK, good. Now let's go to the fulfillment center. Hey, guys, do we have the t-shirt? Nope. We have to fly, it fr fly in from China. Oh, god, that will be expensive. T-shirt costs 2 euros. Fuel costs 15. OK, that was not too effective. What can we do? If someone would know that I will order a t-shirt tomorrow, then he would have started that t-shirt delivery a day ago. And it doesn't need to be a f an airplane. It can come by car. It can become cheaper, and so on. Now, what if we go to the extreme with this? And what if we say that there is a subscription, you can subscribe, and you always get the newest t-shirts that you like. If you don't like them, just send it back. Why not? I would be happy, like, oh, again, a new t-shirt, how fun. Oh, again, a new t-shirt. Th there are these fast fashion brands, there is uh, one overseas, who's exactly doing that. The prediction that what I will like is making them able to act on that prediction. They no longer care about, in, uh, in the sense, whether I ask for the t-shirt or not. T-shirt or not, They're actively sending it out. So the business model change, I think, or, or the main message what will happen, is that who has the better ability to predict what comes up, what, what will be ordered, what the behavior of people will be, has a business advantage. And if he has a business advantage, he most possibly can do something with competitors. And that's what Amazon did. This is the model of Amazon 
during time, like in time, there are the certain dates where Amazon decided that certain functions or business units are no longer executed by someone else but owned by Amazon, comma. If we are that good at predicting, for example, shipment, why aren't we selling the shipment service? Why aren't we doing a logistics company? So that bookstore that was originally Amazon became first an online retailer, then it became a logistics company, then it became a service provider for warehousing, then it became many, many things in the sense of that power that it can predict what will happen enabled it to just kick out the competition and become more and more platform-like. Now you are having a hard time doing as good logistics service as Amazon does. Since everyone uses Amazon's data, uh, everyone's using Amazon, it goes into an Amazon data center. That's why it's more easy to learn what people want. So Amazon can push out some, some good predictions. So everyone uses Amazon. Then the whole thing starts again. So from the business cycle perspective, I think this is what's happening. Whoever has the best prediction will have the best customer experience, and that means that he will have more customers and will lead to better predictions, and so on. But on the other hand, what does this do with society? Okay, let's assume two scenarios. One scenario is that these prediction engines don't work. Okay, that's the easy scenario. Let's try to bring them. Meaning that we should go into examples when predictive engines don't work. I don't know if you see the picture. This was a real life picture. Huge problem. Huge problem. This happened live with Google. Google had to apologize for two weeks long because people wanted to lynch Google after the thing, very understandably. If a predictive engine fails, it fails miserably. It doesn't fail small, it fails like hell. That's the interesting part. And why does it fail like hell? Because what it could do is observe data, come up with some kind of patterns from the data, and say something. My favorite example, also a very instructive page, there is a guy who is collecting all the spurious correlations he can find. So if you look at this data, you can say that the divorce rate in United States Maine is because people consume more margarine. <laughs> and th there is another one where it's uh, the people who are droning in swimming pools and the appearance of Nicolas Cage in films. <laughs> now guess what is going causing what, isn't that? Okay, so inside data you have all kind of rubbish. And you, will, you always will have all kind of rubbish, people droning and Nicolas Cage and whatnot. So if you just sh shift, shuffle data into a system and say, like, figure out, it will totally figure it out. Why not? Let me give you an example. This is an example of an image uh, tagging service, whereby the task of the system is to get the picture and do the tags. What is the tag? Tag is left. Picture, a man is holding. OK, not man, a, a boy. OK, let's go. A man is holding a dog in his hand. Why dog? Why? Because in the training data, there were two gazillion house pets, and everyone was hugging the house pets. No one was hugging a goat. Actually, I, I don't do that, okay, regularly. But because of the big number of examples where people were hugging dogs, the classifier is very confidently saying, well, this is furry, has four legs. Come on, this is a dog, isn't that? That's what happens in these systems. That's what happens because, if you look at the next example, task was to get stripes on this animal. Yeah, that's very funny because the stripes are kind of okay-ish, but just check this. Isn't that funny when the stripes go over and the pillar is stripey? Because the system has no clue about animals, objects, all the things that we take for granted, it sees the pixels and just draws the stripes. Now you get some stripy pillars, okay? These are the limitations. Since we do much of the pattern recognition raw from data. And if you just give a task to a system to move right, it would be obvious that you want it to say that move right on your legs. 
Now what it does is just it backflips and does this kind of funny motion to get the wrong. So this system is basically solving the task, but since you assume that the task solution is normally to walk on your legs, my friend, and you didn't say that you should walk on your legs, now there is this crawling motion, which is, I mean, does it move left? Yes. Does it do what you want? <laughs> no, 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 not that really much, okay? So these systems are basically at this stage marvelously learning to move left, uh, problematically solving it as they can. This is the part when it doesn't work. And there are creative people who figured out how to make it not work, meaning that how to break these systems. Input is that nice. Panda, everyone sees, it's a panda. Confidence level, 57.7% .7 confidence by the system that it is a panda. Who nice? Some nice people from MIT figured out that if you add this noise to the panda, for the human eye, it still sees li looks like a panda, isn't that? Uh, this is no, no big deal. Just that it's 99.3% accuracy gibbon. And if you just happen to be on a self-driving car and there is a stop sign where a nice fellow put a sticker with this noise on it, and if you look at this example, that the image recognition engine will see bottles and not a stop sign, and you're speeding with 60 miles an hour into an intersection, that might be unhealthy, isn't that? So these things, because of the correlations that are in there, are totally breakable. And what is breakable? People will break it. But let's spend the last two and a half minutes of the talk about what if, it, what if these things work? Let's assume that they do. The problem is that sometimes we are amazingly predictable. Guys from the US analyzed Google Street, uh, Street View, like you know these pictures about the streets, and they fed Google Street View image, raw images to a, a system that is observing this environment and trying to predict that this, the district that they observe will vote Democrat or Republican. Amazingly enough, they succeeded. Meaning that from the surrounding area, from the demographics, from the whole setup of that neighborhood, it was predictable whether we politically exercise our free will in this or that direction. That's amazingly bad, isn't that? It gets worse. Absolutely, because it gets personal. Personal meaning that people uh, set up an experiment whereby they controlled, they did a personality test uh, on people and they asked their relatives, friends, and so on to fill out a, per a questionnaire about their friend or their relative or their spouse. They got these questionnaires and then they built up a system that went on Facebook and observed some Facebook likes. 10 likes, 70, 150 or 300. Turns out to be that the personality questionnaire filled out by my spouse was beaten by a computer based on 300 Facebook likes. Meaning that whoever can observe 300 Facebook likes know me better than my immediate family members. Hands up who did more than 300 likes on Facebook. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing. Meaning that it, since there are patterns in our social behavior, the potential to predict some insights about us is huge. And even when we want to hide, this is one of the key elements, so this is this system is using Wi-Fi signals, normal Wi-Fi routers that we have here, to reconstruct a human pause, just with the slight added problem that that human is behind the wall. Happens to be that I install a router at home, and I'm just now have giving those signals out into the free, where someone can sit there and predict whether I'm standing, sitting, or lying down in my home. Which is, again, groovy enough. And I think the big question that we have to face now 
is that these predictive technologies are here. We have to live with them. We can say that, no, we, we, we generally say that we don't use anything like this ever. But then we skip the business benefit. On the other hand, can I say that this is my electromagnetic spectrum and my Wi-Fi signal, so please don't predict anything on top of it? Uh, well, <laughs> it's not your electromagnetic thing. It's not your electrons. It's everyone's electrons, isn't that? So the big question is, I think, not what we think, that these things don't work and need more elaboration, and there is a big risk in them breaking. But the big question is that they're here, they're affecting our lives, and we should figure out what to do with the ability of people and technology to predict us. I think this is kind of the state we are at in AI, and I think w in the further discussions we will try to elaborate on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Levente, very much for this very interesting uh, opening keynote. And uh, we are going to ki continue now with the uh, startup pitch battle. And um, yeah, how is it going to work? So every startup um, is going to pitch for maximum seven minutes. And then um, one question can be asked after the pitch. And the person pitching can choose the yeah, person asking the question, so look very friendly. And um, yeah, um, my colleague Anna is going to show a sign when you have two minutes left in your pitch and also when it's then over. And we are going to start with um, Lingualytics and Florian May, who is the CEO. Please come on stage. Big Data and Artificial Intelligence, Products and Services for your knowledge business. What is the idea of Lingualytics? It was just my frustration. Why? Sorry? It was just my frustration. Why? I love libraries and I love books, but when I ask a book a question, then I don't get an answer. And this is crazy. But this was worse for Lingualytics to give me an answer on my question when I read a book. What kind of problems or challenges do we see? Um, how to find the right knowledge on a huge number of documents? It can be a very time-consuming process. You do not know what your company knows. We see more problems in your daily business you work with different papers, email, legal documents, and some others more. But often the assessment of such documents is made by experts. It's expensive and it's slow. What is our answer? Um, we have created a research platform for users worldwide because they have all the same problem they search knowledge and information in a current working context. And the relevant context is driven by artificial intelligence. Hopefully that your video is now running. Look at our platform. Now you see the platform. We choose a, doc we choose a document. <coughs> Now immediately you will see the text on the document. This is your working context. But now I have a question to the system. We are in the working context. And to get an answer. But consider this answer based on the import of many, many documents. That means you import thousands or millions of documents. And the system gives you answers on the level of a page. That means you save very much working time. Such a, such a platform needs a strong architecture. 
you need servers, you need security, you need artificial intelligence model, you need a data import. We have created a machine which is able to import thousands of documents to be able to train the models. And this machine is deliverable on premise and in cloud. Um, because we have created this machine, we have create our first product, which is using this core. It's an office extension. Let me start a video again. You see the office extension. Okay, you should see it. You should see office. You should again your work. You should again your working context. You work on a document. And if you start to search, you get answers. What is the special issue on these answers? I call it a 360 degree perspective. Why? You have your work in context. That means, oh, I was too fast. Mm, okay. So. Sorry for repeating. Um, the thing is, um, you have one question to the system. We get the answer on page level and to get the answer on different channels from documents, from mails, from social media, maybe from your own systems, ERP, CM, whatever. That means you have one system stop with much data and you get for one question answer on different data sources which saves you a lot of time because you have an overview from different channels for your question. So, of course, we built some models on our core. We built models which understand the sentiments of males, which are able to route a mail to the right expert. We created models which can analyze and find legal documents. And we create, of course, models for analyzing social media and more are prepared. So let me make a short conclusion. I have introduced you in the research platform, which understands the working context. We have created an office extension, which helps you in the daily business life. And we created models for solving detailed business problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, anyone has a question? Don't be shy. Yeah. Is it only for keywords? Of course not. Of course not. Keywords are uh, simple, but uh, you have a you have a wider, bigger context. That means the whole page, the whole document or your whole document collection is the working context, this makes it so complex, okay? And you search not just one document, you search among hundreds of thousand documents and find the relevant page. And just to make it so sophisticated, okay? All right, put your hands together, big applause. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is Uli Erzleben with his startup Smack. And we quickly have to change this here. Yes, yeah, so if you were uh, just maybe to use the time and do some advertisement. Um, if you're wondering when the next event, AI event, will be, because we said it's a series, so it's more than one event. Uh, it will be in September. There's not a fixed date yet, but it will be around that time. And here we go. Have fun. Hi. I'm using my own computer because I'm going to do something that you should never do in a pitch. I do a live demo. <laughs> um, I'm Uli Axleben, uh, co-founder of Smack and a bunch of other companies. And um, here's what we do. And here's what we do. We develop and apply deep learning technology and combine it with cloud software to fix invoice processing. And we do this to make work better and organizations more efficient, obviously. So 
why, why does invoice processing has to be fixed? Because it's terrible. It's really terrible. It's manual, it's um, paper-based, and it leads to a, a couple of really bad things. It takes a very long time, on average 12 days, to process an invoice from entry to the final archive. Um, it costs you more than actually eight euros. And um, human processing, so typing in data, has an error rate somewhere between three to four percent. And we provide solutions and technology to make that significantly better, as you can see. So what do we offer? Um, we have a bunch of software applications, like document management, uh, workflow, engine, an accounting service, so basically everything that you need to process an invoice from a software application side. And then we deeply integrate automation services. And the core of our automation is document understanding, extracting data from invoices, rich data sets. And those data can be used to validate, to check for duplicates, to do mathematical checks, and to use neural networks, again, to predict accounting records. And then we have a bunch of manual services as well. And we package our solutions in beautiful cloud-native software that run on a Kubernetes cluster, multi-cloud, private cloud, and we integrate with the leading finance platforms like SAP, Microsoft Dynamics, DATEV, if it has to be DATEV. Um, yeah, and now I'm switching to another slide format because uh, last year we split the deep learning part of our technology into another company. It's called Hypertos because we have been expanding our technology to other areas, not just the finance department. And I want to explain what the core technology is real quick because Automating invoice processing sounds incredibly boring, but it's not. It's a quite amazing technology problem to solve. And we are using three types of machine learning technologies to do this, word embedding, word vectors. It's normalizing words. And think about it, from a accounting perspective, is a tomato not that different from an onion? I'm going to get that a little later. Um, we are using recurrent neural networks to understand the word in the context of words before and after the word. Important to understand meaning. And then if you look at a semi-structured document like an invoice, there's also a computer vision problem to solve because you have structures like tables, for example, that you need to understand based on the image itself, right? So you have to understand what the grid of the table looks like in order to get all the products and services that got bought by a company out of those documents. So, and now the live demo. Let's hope for the best. So I'm actually using a real life invoice, a client invoice. I'm allowed to use this one. I have a permission. And what are you going to see now? Oh, you're not seeing it. Uh, it's a live demo. <laughs> um, hold on. I know what to do. I know what to do. I know what to do. Hold on. Uh, And let's see. Hmm. Okay, live demo failed, I guess. I tried it beforehand and it worked perfectly well. Yeah? Just to be clear here. Okay, so how do I get back now? Yeah, one of one. <laughs> okay, I continue without slides. Great example, never do a live demo. So what you would have seen is a pretty large invoice with a lot of uh, invoice line items that are just sent in the cloud, and then it runs through Tesseract 4, it's an OCR technology, and then the first machine learning service would uh, classify all the data um, into what it actually is, right? Invoice numbers, um, delivery dates, all the different line items, amounts, uh, prices, unit prices, um, all the tax information, all the payment information, everything, up to 74 
and the tears. Here we go. So the trick is, I don't see it now on my screen. So this is going to be interesting. Uh, okay, so this is what happens. I send it to the cloud, it runs through an OCR, and then all the data gets classified. And then we take the information that we extracted and predict the financial account following SK Annual Fear. It's an accounting framework. So let's see what happens. Real life invoice from a client. Here it is. So what you can see is um, basically what's called header data, right? You have the tax rates, you have the total amounts, invoice date, what have you. You have payment information, but you also have all the things that got invoiced, right? So this is what actually got bought. And basically everything else that is on the invoice. And we are using this information now to use a pretty simple feed-forward neural network model to predict the right accounting entries. And we do this because we understand the supplier, we understand all the line items of the invoice, and that is actually fairly simple to do this if you have a good training data set. So this is accounts payable automation, Eingangsrechnungsautomatisierung using neural network technology. So back to my slides now. <laughs> can, you do it? can you reverse do it? <laughs> um, and Hypertas is using this technology for a lot of document-based processes, expense management. We are doing a lot of business in auditing when companies check documents to find problems. Um, medical prescriptions, a lot of semi-structured document cases. Hmm. So and then the, I have a slide that just um, highlights how we use it for accounts payable automation, but I think you can imagine how that would work. And uh, then there's a case study. It shows how it actually works with real clients. Then there is a slide called Logo Soup, where it shows some of our big clients and big partners we are working with because we are uh, actually already making revenues and, and have a, a quite a bunch of clients. And then there's a slide that I like very much. It's based on a Deloitte study asking CFOs what they expect from digitization. And it's all about making processes quicker, with less errors, saving costs, being more flexible and improving work. And obviously we check all those boxes. Um, and then there's the last slide, which I always use to stop, and this uh, says, that the space for accounts payable workflow software is a three billion market uh, opportunity. It's quite nice. But the cost bucket in Germany alone for accounts payable processing is 50 billion because companies spend a lot of money on manual processing in those tasks. And this is something that we automate. And this would be my pitch without slides. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, thank you so much, Uli. While Alina is going to take over the technical plugin here again, <laughs> um, are there any questions? Ah, there. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot. So you showed an invoice. So, what if there is an amount, and uh, if someone uh, like uh, cross over and uh, put a new amount? So, will your system? Can detect the new amount, or um, how it will detect? Cross over, you mean cross it out? And yeah. Or it depends on what the OCR does with that. It's a little hard to see. I don't know. It's a black box technology okay. in the end. Probably it's not going to so work. So that means uh, in that case, you still need a human interaction. You always need a human in the loop, because what we do is not, it's assisted work. We are doing assisted work. We are not replacing accountants. We are making them more efficient, assisted work. So they have to do less data entry. They can be much quicker accounting. Um, you can do validations and checks that a human being would not even be able to do because it would be just way too time consuming. Just imagine a mathematical check of all line items if they actually add up to the totals of an invoice. Impossible to do, but we can do this automatically. Okay, uh, another question I have. So do you also have, uh, uh, do you also have a plan to classify those invoices? Because as far as I know, like you have different tax uh, rules and all, so do you also have something in your list to classify uh, data or invoices? Or I mean, this is what we do, right? I mean, it's classification of data that is on invoices. And then, of course, 
you can have models that help you to identify. It's actually not so much machine learning based, it's just rather rule based rule to based. actually say, hey, this is a contractor's or a handyman invoice versus um, a product invoice and, and things like that, of course. If you understand a document completely, if you can classify and understand all the information that is on an invoice, it's quite easy to figure out what that invoice actually is, right? But understanding it, this is a big challenge. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much. Another applause for Uli. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I want to welcome uh, Lea Rosa, the CEO, and Corvin Porton, the CTO of Neval. Put your hands together. Okay, wow. <laughs> a lot of people interested in AI. AI. That's really exciting. So uh, we are Nival. I'm Leah, CEO, co-founder. This is our lovely CTO, Corvin. Hi. <laughs> and since we're such a private circle tonight, I want to start off with a confession. I really like gambling. I really like everything from dices, cards, poker, slot machines. But my favorite pastime is horse racing. And if you don't believe me, I have proof. This is me at the Happy Valley Race Course in Hong Kong. And I think you can kind of tell by the faces, the facial expressions on our faces, the amount of money we made that night. <laughs> now, obviously, horse racing is a very, very sophisticated science. But I want to boil it down for you tonight to two factors, the horse and the jockey. Now, there's one part of the community that says that it's all about the horse, and they will spend hours and hours on researching what is the best horse. But I can tell you, they don't win. Now, the other part of the community says, it's all about the jockey. And they will read articles and watch interviews, but I can tell you, they don't win. So from my personal experience, it's about the combination of a great horse and a great jockey. Because if you combine an average horse with a great jockey, they don't win. And it's the other way around, too. Now you might think, okay, I don't really care about horse racing. I'm invested in, I don't know, cryptocurrencies, so I don't need to do any more gambling. And of course, this is not about horse racing. It's about a fundamental question that investors face every day when they look at startups. And they ask themselves, is this a good combination of a great horse, a great product, and a great jockey, a great team? Now, to analyze a product and to say whether a product is good, there's a lot of tools out there, great tools. But what do investors do if they want to find out whether a team, whether the jockey, is good enough to drive the horse to the finishing line? And this is where we come in. So, I also need to do a confession today, and I don't like gambling. So, that's why we came up with our software which is called Neval Maps, with, which visualizes and structurizes team structures. And therefore, we are able to explore hidden patterns within these structures, and therefore, um, helps you to make better decisions for your investments. And according, um, ad in addition to that, we also connect um, publicly available data to that, and also um, giving you this all-around view of the data and of the team, and enabling you and the investors to make connected decisions in the end. So let's go with a use case. So this is Alexa. Alexa likes to work, uh, to invest in AI, and she is really overwhelmed because currently on the market there are so many AI startups. So she doesn't really know where to invest. Since she's really time constrained, she goes with and saying like, okay, I will only measure and analyze startup A, B, and C. However, 
E might be the unicorn, so she will miss that out. What we actually do, due to our analytics of the team, we give her an, a clue about is this team potentially a successful team or not. So we also see that startup E is included in that and that you and that Alexa actually knows like this team will be a su sufficient one which will be like a more successful startup. So how are we going to do that? We are taking different measures from um, search and network analytics. So the one is homophily which actually measures the connectedness of the team, so internally. So it analyzes actually how a team is bonded together and also therefore is able to um, accomplish bigger tasks. We also measure strong and weak ties, so this actually measures kind of the market access the team has. So if there's really some, some measures that can take um, in order to get into the market easily and quick. And also, we measure the degree of centrality. So this actually gives a clue for the investor which of the persons is crucial for the startup team in order not to lose them. So, and combining all of these measures and adding some, some magic there, we are able to identify the winning team and helping you to make the profit. And also, Alexa is happy now. So thank you. Thank you very much. You can, you can keep it for now because you still have that question. Yeah. Yeah? Do you give it? Okay. Uh, you, you guys have to choose, right? It's not me choosing. Put up your hand who wants to ask a question. Uh, there's one in the back. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you can ask them later, right? With a beer in your hand, it's even nicer. Um, thank you, first of all. I uh, have a question. Um, for the startup, it has to be fully transparent on every single social media network, right? Because um, for me, my partner, he's, he's not using LinkedIn, but uh, he's still, um, a co -found, still the co-founder of our startup. So how would you identify um, a startup which is not on social media? So it's actually not about LinkedIn or social media. It's more about um, Handelsregister data. So Pardon? Uh, Handelsregister, it's a German uh, yep, registry yep. where you register companies. So, and there you need to um, tell like which, which uh, startups your, your co-founders invested in or at least um, where is your co-founder at. And based on that, you can actually yeah, circle this data or connect this data together with the data that they exchange in order to getting funding. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Big applause for Nival. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And I welcome the last battle participant, Swarm Market Research AI, Peter Hart, the CEO. Put your hands together. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. So, um, it's at Swarm Market Research AI, or product is Pythia. Um, and I'll uh, just sum up the story real quick, because I just heard it's a five-minute show. So, um, my background is building consumer brands. Like, I've built startups since 2013, building like a cosmetics brand, a socks brand, nutritious supplements brand and all kind of stuff like that. And at some point, Rossmann called. You know, Rossmann is the biggest German drugstore chain. They have like 2,200 stores. And he was like, how come you guys have products we don't? Like, how come you guys have trend products we don't have? Because we were always looking like, what's the next trend product? And we're only building that. And he was like, how do you guys do it? And I was like, yeah, well, we check Amazon US and we check uh, Google Trends and we build whatever is uh, being you know, trendy there. Like whatever is ranking up the sales ranks in, in Amazon US, we build here and sell it in Germany. So you have like a time delay of a couple of months or sometimes a year. 
and we just copy that or we check Google Trends and see whatever is trending in beauty and we build that. And so he said, like, that's great, can we use that too? <laughs> and I said, of course, if you, if you pay for it, then you can. And <laughs> so we were, we were sitting there in front of their headquarters and he was like, yeah, DM is doing like all these shenanigans with these cool funky things and our teams kind of don't find the cool beauty trends in time. I was like, okay, we'll do it. And then he was like, and <laughs> we also have a lot of suppliers who, are, who we are you know, relying on, all the brands that are in Osman. We need them to have the trend products too, so can you do it for them too? And uh, we bring you all the customers and in exchange we get a little share in the company and I was like, that's great, <laughs> sounds great. So <laughs> I said it's going to be like 50k a year for everyone, like for each one of them. And he was like, yeah, that's a great price. And I thought like, that's a great deal. All right, so we went off. <laughs> we went off and uh, we started for Rossman and then all the others, like now we're like advising f about 45% of all the brands that are in the drugstores. Um, <coughs> So um, we started with Rossmann and then we noticed that their interest and their portfolio is way bigger than ours and it was a lot of manual work to look for each sub, you know, sub category of each like from shower gels to face masks and to nutritional supplements to vitamins and everything and go through Google Trends and check it out and our team like a small part of our team sitting there who were back then already with us and were like, oh my god, this is a lot of work. <laughs> Even though we get a lot of money for it. So, so we had to automize the whole thing a little bit. And then we thought there's this trendy thing since we're, you know, selling trends to, to companies. Um, there's this trendy thing called AI, so we better have an AI do our work. So that's what we did. We, we built a neural network that goes through search data. That's the only sentence you guys have to pay attention to. Our, our, our neural network trains to go to th through search data of Google and Amazon and pick out keywords that suddenly show potential of a trend. Right? Okay, <laughs> once again. It takes a big stack of search data and it looks at the evolution of each keyword through time. So a keyword might have been Google, like the fidget spinner. The fidget spinner is a great example. The fidget spinner suddenly was Googled like crazy and it was a trend. Now what the AI is supposed to do is learn to differentiate between a small hype, a big hype, a long-term mega trend and all the other forms of a trend. So how does it do it? It starts learning from the evolution of the search data to to learn from one evolution of one word to take those learnings and apply them on other words. So you give it a lot of data and it looks at millions of trends from the past or millions of evolutions of search data of a keyword, and then it starts figuring out how to predict the future of a keyword with a certain degree of certainty. Is that clear? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So what happens in the end is it takes each keyword it finds, so we buy the keywords of a category, so there's you know, suppliers who you can buy from, and they give you like two million words from the category beauty and they update them all the time. You take those two million keywords, you let them run through your AI, the AI looks at each and, each and every one of them and then picks you out the, I don't know, 100 best performing ones. And best performing means best performing in the future. So it gives you basically the best 100 trends from a search data, data perspective, which can also mean that it's a, I don't know, that it's an ingredient from beauty that's criticized right now and Googled due to that. 
but it also brings you the ones that are certain suddenly hyped and you a lot of companies didn't see it because the worst thing especially for german mittelstands companies like small mid caps is that they suddenly walk into a store and they're the biggest i don't know face mask producer and suddenly they see a face face mask in the store that's the best seller they never heard about <laughs> so that happens a lot and we try to solve that for them and ai solves the part of us looking through each and every keyword and looking at the chart and being like that looks like it could go up it saves us from that okay how much time do i have left zero minutes okay yeah <laughs> That's the Rossmann slide. <laughs> and for anyone who is geeky enough, that's the technologies we use. So if you have questions to that, yeah. Thank you, Peter. Applause. <laughs> so, questions? Nobody. It was so clear, without slides. Thank you. It's crazy. I, I was trying hard. Yeah. All right, well then, thank you very much. Another applause, and yeah. Thank you. All right, so now you've been sitting there long enough, very comfortably. Uh, now it's your turn, actually, uh, because we now need to find out um, who did the best pitch and who will be joining the panel discussion. So grab your phones, you don't have to sign up or anything, just grab your phone, type in www.menti.com and use the code 985986 and you have the four startups there and you have one minute now to select the startup you like, or not the startup, but the pitch you liked best. You still need the code. All right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't kill me. <coughs> there it is. You even get some extra time now because it was my mistake. All right, everybody done? Anyone still working on it? All right, good. So let's see. Okay, Peter, congratulations. Oh, you cannot see it. Uh, what, what, what? Where is it? There we go. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> all right, so how this will go now. Um, first of all, congratulations again, Peter. Um, we're going ha to have the AI Appler talk in a few minutes. Those of you who love football will get the allergy. You know, beer, football, talking about it. Um, but here it's Appler, and uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the ethics of AI, and in order to set the mood for that, uh, Dilek uh, from IBM, who uh, has been with us before, uh, will hold a short impulse keynote. She's the leader of IBM Infrastructure for Artificial Intelligence, Big Data, and Open Source. So uh, give her a applause. Thank you. And now uh, a topic it's really, we have heard a lot of also from Laventa and I will come back to this. 
<laughs> because the first thing will be how would you decide if you are in a car and you know there will be an accident now you are driving in the car and there is coming another car and you know you will do now the accident on the left hand side there is the old woman on the right hand side the woman with the baby difficult ethical situation for all of us and this is something where we are maybe doing spontan intuitive and decision on where we are driving with the car but if we are doing this in an AI area this means we need to program the system what he needs to do so we need to decide before which decision should be taken really difficult for us as human but more difficult if you need to take this decision to decide it before and to program it into a system so this is also uh, why we and this is in that area of Francesca Rossi she is at IBM research and she joined a community of high-level expert group of AI who are bringing together in on a European level to discuss such kind of topics she is one part of this IBM is not the only company of course there is of course Allianz or Zalando uh, also uh, some of the universities are included in this group who are discussing about these things and what are the social norms for it and you have it here on the other side but whose norms so this is also something what is really interesting to understand if you are in Arabian maybe the decision is another one this is a cultural behavior if you are in Germany the decision is maybe some uh, in, in another form yeah so of each country it could be a total other decision who is be taken and this is why the European Commission comes together to establish some requirements to have the discussion on which level they are deciding this kind of things and of course which are the main points on it and one of this is of course AI shouldn't limit in any way human autonomy also the thing that AI systems won't harm humans so we don't want to get in that point that AI is, uh, uh, is uh, doing a human something or uh, doing something what harms us and where we are uh, getting in risk out of it also at the, at the point of privacy and data governance each of you and I know, uh, here in Germany it's special about GDPR everybody wants to get control of his data even I'm knowing sometimes people who are not in LinkedIn or in Xing because they are saying I don't want that anybody is doing something with my data or with my pictures the next thing is transparency yeah that we have trust in our dis, uh, dis, uh, decisions and how we are getting there and another point is the subject diversity so what is if AI is starting to say this kind of man is homosexual and I don't want to uh, give him something to work we don't want such things yeah so this is also something uh, to say diversity is a real big point in AI in programming when we are programming deep learning and the next thing is uh, who is benefiting from AI who could uh, uh, could take that something sorry and accountability so each person who is doing something is accountable for the things he is programming so this is something what the high-level expert group on European level has put together as points who are important in the AI area when we are talking about 
uh, about ethics. And we as IBM has also a view on it, and uh, for IBM this subject is really important. This is why Francesca Rossi is uh, joining in this group to have these discussions that we are saying it's important that everybody who is programming networks and neural nets needs to be accountable for that what he is doing. It needs to be an alignment into the European Commission and the expert group. It needs to be explainable and this is something where all companies have a subject with because if you are doing a deep learning or neural network model you need to explain, also from the security point of view, why, the decision, why a computer is taking a decision and on which data. So uh, this is also something what it's needed to be explainable. Fairness in diversity. Um, and this is, for example, face recognition is something, uh, what is a use case, of course, IBM. Uh, don't do such kind of use cases uh, because we want to avoid that somebody is saying um, take a video and we are saying this person is uh, black, this person is white, this person is maybe homosexual or something like this. We don't want to diverse somebody. For us as IBM, everybody is equal and everybody has the, ch uh, the same chance. So we, want, uh, we don't want to be take part in such kind of programs with, as IBM. And uh, of course, user data rights, that is uh, what I have explained. Everybody uh, want to be part of his data and, and want to know what will happen with their data. So this is also why our chairman Martinetta says the EU guidelines were given out is an important point. And to coming back to that what Levent said, there is a man behind the wall. What will happen if somebody is looking in each of our houses and saying this person is sitting, is working, is, uh, is sleeping, is doing that, and then from that they are predicting something what will uh, harm you in any way as a human. And this is something where we as IBM are saying this is really important for us that this kind of things are not happening and uh, that we are more on the positive side, also on the point that AI is bringing us new jobs. And I guess this is uh, one part also of the discussion we are having. Uh, bringing us new jobs, bringing us new things where we could learn about it. We will have the discussion in the panel, uh, in the panel later uh, how this could benefit us and uh, look really careful in the point what could be done in a negative way with AI and we as IBM don't want to take part of this. So this is it from my side. So I think now it's time for the panel. Yeah, thank you very much, Dilek. Yeah, and actually because I'm not an NI expert, uh, I'm not going to lead uh, the panel, but my colleague, uh, Kevin, Dr. Kevin Bauer, who is our tech court here, um, AI geek, I would say, but in a friendly Thanks. way, <laughs> uh, will Great take start. over now and will uh, and also announce the panelists. And um, yeah, feel free to have that appler during the talk. But yes. you can also, of course, have water. So have fun. Yeah, thank you, Alina. And thanks to all of our panelists so far. I really loved all the talks. And at this point, I really want to th uh, say thank you also to the startups which did not win here. And I would, all, uh, I would ask you all to give a warm applause again for the startups who did not win this race. Yeah, and as you might have noticed, I already opened my Epler because uh, I'm a big fan of football talks on Sunday morning and they always start by filling in a glass of, of beer and so I, in the terms of the AI Epler talk, I start with an AI, AI, AI Epler, sorry. Yeah, um, here is already our topic um, and I really love the introduction of Levento when he showed us the video of the Terminator who takes over the world in, in the film, 
However, we are not talking about taking over the entire world. For now, we will concentrate here on what happens when AI takes over our jobs. And we will ask the question, uh, to what extent AI will exacerbate income equality. And thanks to Dilek at this point, who gave a great introduction. And I'm really happy to welcome several panelists here, starting with Anita Klingel, who is a tech aficionado with a strong background. Yeah? She worked at the Bertelsmann Stiftung. She joined there a new project on ethics and algorithm, uh, contributing to several different publications there. And uh, before that, she worked for Mercator Stiftung. So uh, welcome to Anita Klingel. And the next one, I'm also very happy to be able to welcome him here. He's one of the founder from the German AI scene, Professor Dr. Wolfgang Bibel, who is an emeritus from the computer science department at TU Darmstadt and made the long way here from Konstanz. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you. Yeah. Our other panelists you have already met, on the one hand, please come up, Levente. <laughs> and of course, in the order of seeing them, the winner of our startup discussion, Peter. <laughs> ah, there he is, sorry. And the last one, Dilek, who gave an inspiring talk on AI ethics at IBM. Yeah, welcome to all of you. I would suggest that we start with a brief introduction of the new panelists here. Um, maybe also in order with Anita. So, hi everyone, my name is Anita. I sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Um, I just assumed that was loud enough. So as you heard, my name is Anita. I focused on the ethic parts and algorithm as part of a project of Bertelsmann Foundation, which is one of the largest foundations in Germany. And what we're trying to do is pretty close to what Dilek described. We're trying to f frame the political discussion on how we can make sure that AI serves humans and humans don't serve AI. Um, part of what we did is uh, collect different stories of what algorithms are currently doing. Uh, we published them in a book a month ago, Wir und die intelligenten Maschinen. And I hope I will be able to bring some of the ethical aspects and some anecdotes that might help us to the table and to address the elephant in the room. Yes, I'm currently programming a human neural network. But release is in December, so you're safe. You heard my name and where I was teaching, not very far from here. Uh, but let me add that I started work in artificial intelligence you guess, 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago in 1969. And, <laughs> and as a matter of fact, we celebrate next week at the Technical University in Munich this event, this anniversary. So, um, by the way, you have these nice, uh, uh, well, the, I, I have a million questions, so to speak. When did I f do my first email? When I did I send my first email? It would be nice now if you put on, on your uh, phones and uh, send the result to the same thing here. Uh, the one who wins is the one who is closest and gets one euro from me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is the question. Then <clears throat> I did a lot of publications. I have a lot of students who do now excellent research worldwide in the world and also have start, uh, done startups and are in industry and so forth. So. Uh, you are next. <laughs> yeah. um, I think we heard... Isn't it? Ah, now it's working again. Yeah, I think we had introductions at this point. 
Um, I really like the, the speaker so far, as I already said, simply because it showed what AI can do, and, and starting with the talk of Levent, it also showed what it might be doing in the future. And given that I've seen all the, the startup pitches here tonight, I'm wondering to what extent is the future forecasted by you already here? So my, my first question to this panel, and, and again starting with the order of this evening, Levente, is what is the potential of, of AI right now after seeing all these great startup technologies to take, our over uh, to take our over our jobs? Well, I think thinking in terms of jobs is a bit of a, a misnomer. So let's start with which part of your job you hate the most. Really? Just if I would say that I take busy, over busy the uh, I take over the emailing for scheduling some uh, meetings and appointments for you, would you be super duper attached to that? No, definitely yeah. not. Can and you would feel me. that your job has been taken away. Not that part of the job. Yeah. Okay, I think that's that's this kind of the realistic framing of it. So generally, I think what we we used to think is that jobs are kind of homogeneous things. Well, someone is an accountant, meaning that it's just one thing he does. No, actually, from the perspective of the workflow, he does 200 different things. And from 200 different things, there are ma many of the manual repeating, automizable tasks that honestly don't need 11 billion neurons for that. You can, get, you can handle it with less. But on the other hand, whenever there is kind of a unique judgment, unique judgment of values, unique judgment of, of some concept that has an impact on someone else's life, and, uh, and I think here the EU directive is pretty clear, that the proportion with which a system is affecting another human, it needs the more judgment. Would you be comfortable that the judgment is made instead of you? No, not necessarily. So I think what we have to understand here is that the, the taking away the jobs part will be taking away the tasks that are less demanding from the cognitive perspective and maybe enabling some tasks, some higher level tasks, which are very uniquely still the human domain. And maybe taking away those jobs, quote unquote, so the tasks is not that bad anyhow. Peter, you're smiling. As a CEO of a startup, would you, on the one hand, agree, and, and would you say that your company is taking away jobs? Yep, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but um, like we're currently working in Germany an average of like officially at least 39, 38 hours, and uh, we have uh, free Saturdays and. Uh, even like 40 years ago, it y used to not be common to have Saturdays free. And on the other hand, we have all the comfort in the world, which um, damages us to some part, but we have it. So um, we can spend a lot more and work a lot less, and that's due to automizing things. So um, I think it's every year in the history of humankind, there has been the discussion whether Inventing the wheel will have the impact of having less people carrying things and inventing a computer or, or an email will have less post office guys delivering mail. But in the end, we're doing pretty fine and we're pretty comfortable because we get a lot of stuff done by machines. And yeah, this is the way to do it. Thank you. Um, Anita, I have read several of your articles and, and to some extent you always manage to, to show the limits of AI. Would you say that there are currently limits that we can expect AI to, to, get, to get to and, and stop taking over jobs and leaving jobs to humans? I'm sure there are, but I would agree with Levente that we're currently pushing those boundaries and um, that it's very hard to predict where those boundaries will be five years from now. Maybe he's right and we'll all be home and the hype will have gone. Uh, we certainly hope it doesn't because our jobs rely <laughs> on the hype being existent. Um, I think the question is more of, of how do we design these AI parts and these algorithms. And being among techies, I have a hard time speaking of AI because there was this wonderful tweet that said that if we consider what we have today, weak AI, we might consider paper planes, uh, weak spacecrafts. So we're far from 
actual AI, and it's hard to define how actual AI will change the world because we don't know what it is and what it will look like yet. Thanks. Professor Bibel, you said that you're in, in AI now for 50 years and soon have a celebration in, in Munich on, uh, on this occasion. Have you ever felt such a strong advancement in, in AI in all these years up until now? Well, as Levent uh, already showed in his uh, presentation, there were at least two hypes in AI. And I think the expert, what you call the expert uh, systems hype, uh, was a big one and took a lot of energy for, for us at that time in, in the 80s of the last century. At the same time, people started also to discuss this question about do we um, lose labor? Uh, will people have nothing to do anymore and, and do not earn any money more? It has nothing, there was no effect until today. If I look back, see we have full employment in Germany more or less and there is no, in the, for me, in the next 10 years, no perspective that we should worry about this uh, issue. Actually, the, what you uh, brought in your presentation, there are much deeper problems to worry about right now, like also uh, not only writing up very nice papers like IEEE did or uh, uh, the EU uh, committee or IBM, you did it, but to make it work in law. I mean, the, our politicians have no idea what's coming on, uh, on here and they, we should really press them to make law for these things. And um, if you allow me later on, I, I would like to talk a little bit because we are here in the center of finance and you can do such a lot of bad things in financing even more with this technology. And so we have to do something about this. So you ask another question whether I saw there was expert systems and it went down, but there is a steady progress in the science of artificial intelligence. And that's why now we can show really impressive things and what do you think how I feel after 50 years and seeing this explosion of artificial intelligence? <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, I think that's a very interesting point you bring up here. You say that, that the politics is, is to some extent not seeing what's happening out there. Dilek, you talked about the, the EU and, and several papers that bring up ethic topics here. Do you think they're doing a good job? Of course, there is a long way to go, yeah, because with each technology and with every step we are doing, and uh, there will be coming much more about that, uh, we will need to decide what we are doing with the technology, yeah. But in the moment, it's more on, and I know that there are a couple of accelerators who are doing the startups like you are doing, who are also working on that uh, phase that we here in Germany especially more lacking in the moment on that we are not adapting AI because we are talking too much about the problems of AI. Yeah? And we are inhibiting such uh, things like, and we have uh, something uh, done in, uh, it was in the US, yeah? so because AI could benefit us also in a positive way. And uh, you will always need doctors. Yeah? But if you have a special kind of cancer, for example, and it's only 1% of cancers, you need 200, 300, 400 doctors to come together to identify this cancer. And with AI, we are able to find this cancer sort and uh, to give a medication for this person. So it could help 
to save lives. And it's not only about we are getting rid of jobs, you will also need the doctor because he needs to decide what will happen, uh, but you could take decisions faster to save uh, lives in that case before somebody is dying on cancer. I think that's, that's a very interesting point to think about, right? You said that doctors need to come together and, and discuss things with each other in groups. Yeah, me as a behavioral economist, I'm very often thinking if we talk about replacing jobs, yeah, human jobs with, with AI, it might have s uh, severe or adverse effects on, on social incentives, like I'm in a group and I feel pushed by seeing other doctors perform. Leventa, would you say that this is an issue why humans may be more efficient than, than uh, software to some extent? That they have social incentives that might, might be gone if we introduce too many artificial intelligences? Well, I would say that this is, again, drawing on one of the startup pitches, is not about the horse and not about the jockey. So I think the replacement part is not a company AI replacing people, but companies cooperating with predictive technologies replacing companies who are not cooperating <laughs> with predictive technologies. So I think that the, uh, the macro structure uh, in, in this sense, like the individual incentives or the individual people that are being fired is not the gravest danger. Though from the perspective of being uh, an, a, a profitable participant in the market, it has to be said that there, whoever has the prediction has the advantage. Whoever has the advantage can become a dominating platform. Platform meaning that he is uh, across verticals and across such areas and can leap to other uh, areas that he originally didn't come from. So there, that, that's why I gave some of these examples of companies that are broadening their scope of influence and no longer operating on their original business alone, but based on these predictive technologies being able to, to scale up. And I think if, if we are looking into that question of, of how the market could shift, the market could heavily shift in favor of those who are having the, the predictive technology. And interestingly enough, it's not just the technology because much of the models are kind of open source. So you can use uh, a lot of insights that are out there, kind of open science, but the data is interestingly not open source. So you cannot go to Facebook and say, look, it's such nice data that you collected about 1.1 billion people. Could, you, could, I, could I borrow it for a day? Just, just to look into that, isn't that? I just want to find two things, uh, no, no hassle. Now that doesn't happen. So I think what is very interesting here is that the systematic accumulation of data capital and kind of the shifting of data capital will be the driver of shifting of capital at all. And that's why we have to pay attention to these, these factors that the professor also mentioned from a legislative perspective. But I think that's, that's, a, that's a good point you're making here because what, what you say is it may be a monopolization on markets driven driven by companies, which which leads me to my next question to Anita. Would you would you say that it is the large companies, yeah, like Google, Facebook and, and Apple, who are capturing all, all the gains from, from the productivity growth we, we see here? Ideally no. Because A they started small, um, so we have the possibility to, to interfere. And B, um, if I see the, the invoice producing, thing, I, I would say that everyone profits from it. We just have to make sure that everyone profits from it and then it's not monopolized. And we can do that in a legislative way. I'd prefer to do it bottom up. There are many interesting initiatives in Germany currently focusing. I don't know how y many of you have heard of Open Schufa, where people sent in their Schufa credit score and an NGO reverse engineered the algorithm behind it to find out how Shufa actually scores us. And we all know the impact that Shufa has on getting a flat, which is hard enough in uh, Germany anyway. But for example, the number of moves you have on your credit score impacts that score result. And that's just not fair. So I would say it doesn't depend on the size of the company. It depends largely on the data they have and they can be small and still have amazing data. And it depends on us choosing who we partner with. So I can choose to work with IBM because I know they care about ethics or I can choose to not care about ethics myself and cooperate with whoever offers me the best price. Then I don't have to wonder about the result. Thank you. And Peter, talking about it's, it's not necessarily the, the big established incumbent that can reap benefits. Would, would you agree that it's also possible to, to really develop a large AI firm coming 
not from a position of a great data advantage? Again, please. <laughs> <laughs> Would you agree that you may not be a large incumbent with a lot of data like Google to make it in the AI market? Are you an example for making it in the AI market without starting with tons of data? Well, <coughs> for having a, an AI working properly, you need a lot of data. And you just have to figure out where you get it from. You don't have to have it before that. You can buy it from someone else. We scrape a lot, which Google doesn't like. So we have a whole, <laughs> a whole proxy network that asymmetrically, like, um, scrapes Google and Amazon for the parts of the data they don't want us to get. And um, yeah, so you need a lot of data to make AI because it needs to learn just like humans need a lot of data to learn. So they need to see a lot of stuff to learn, they need to read a lot of stuff to learn, and um, you're basically forming a brain with a neural network and that neural network needs input. That's why Humans learn from input and are so input um, so easy to easily to get addicted from input. So you would you would vote for sharing all the data from from or getting the data from big firms who already have big data like like IBM does. <laughs> Uh, nope, that's but not. You can, you that's, can give not free, the, right? that's not the conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like you? You said you don't sell it data. It depends. It depends. Okay. On what? Uh, on a lot of stuff. <laughs> which is <laughs> it, 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 it's not the conclusion to make all the data public because then you can train a lot of AI on the data. It's it depends on the data. It, it I just can't make it more concrete than that because there are so many parameters depending on what data we're even talking about. Would you agree with that, Professor Bieber? Is this what you saw all, all over the 50 years of experience? Well, not only. Um, in this case, I do not go back 50 <laughs> years. I think we are now in the time where there are big data. And in a sense, I disagree with both you and you. In a sense, because you believe in an idealistic world, and that's good, uh, you are young, I <laughs> <laughs> but I do not believe uh, in, in this idealism because you, what can you do against Google or a company like uh, Alphabet? Or they have such a lot of power now and they have a lot of data. IBM, no more as at my time, IBM was the biggest one at my time, but now it's other companies. So <coughs> there is a big problem with this that, let me say it in the words, capital in the, in the sense of systems is accumulated with a few big companies. And capital, I don't know whether you have heard of Piketty, the French capital uh, uh, scientist, or he has done an excellent job. We need to deal with capital in a different way than we dealt with a hundred years ago. And nothing happens from the side of politics. And that's again another deep problem that you young people could uh, push the politicians into a different direction. So uh, <coughs> the capital thing is a big uh, issue and a system is a capital. Uh, and to how to do deal with that, I don't know. I'm not an economist. But uh, the people have to think about this. Now, to you, big data, you know, say for AI, you need big data. No, only for a few small sections in AI, you need big data. There are completely different applications of artificial intelligence. Just take verification of hardware is a typical AI thing. or structured knowledge you said we have to combine these things structured knowledge and uh, 
deep learning and th these things a big issue and not at all solved you um, i think on your list also was explainability was it how do you do this with a, a neural net approach you have to make it clear and open up what's going on uh, politicians say Amazon has to reveal their uh, policy or their systems. What would this help if they reveal a, th a million lines of code it, it does, they, and they never would do so, so? So what we would have to have is a specification of those systems. We have forgotten that there, for code there is also a specification and there is a very close relationship. So um, uh, I hope I, uh, I addressed your point. Big uh, data is only one thing and uh, for, for one part of artificial intelligence. I think Anita wanted immediately to answer on this. I saw it like waving a hand yeah, in, the yeah. in the middle. Um, but being young uh, and idealistic, I uh, do not accept uh, the, the part where uh, we, don't, we have no choice of making uh, machine learning transparent, which is an argument that I've heard over and over again, and I consider it to be wrong, because we have methodologies like reverse engineering, like feeding it fake data and seeing the result that comes out and concluding from the result, if that was the input and that's the result, we can c draw conclusions to what actual data does. Look at the work of ProPublica, which is an amazing US NGO that does it precisely that for prison algorithms and, and saves people from going to prison, despite the actual algorithm not being transparent. So I refuse to wave the white flag at machine learning from a societal perspective because I require and I demand explainability and I think it's possible and where it isn't possible we must really think hard whether we want a machine to make decisions for us that we can't even explain and I think there must be parts of society where we simply do not want AI to make those decisions uh, e.g. trolley problem. Dilek, youth or experience? <laughs> youth or experience? What is it? Love it. Yeah, because right. I'm 45 years, so <laughs> I'm not old, but I'm also not young. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, uh, so, so for me, it's always that I'm saying there are a lot of possibilities in AI, and this is something where I'm really trusting in, and I'm knowing and I'm coming back again to IBM, and this not, uh, should not be an ad 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 advertisement, but we have really systems who are trusting in this, and who are trying to be explainable or doing things uh, for a data scientist in an easy way, but so that everybody could understand it and could explain it. And I think this is something also when we are coming back to that uh, subject, yeah? We are programming something for example, for an autonomous vehicle, for things that which we are even deciding very, very difficult. Just to add a bit yeah. on this, I think the, the general notion of explainability is, is very interesting since in certain cases, if I demonstrate to you that, look, this was the input, and I expect that the output would be that and that, that's an explanation. But sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes for a nuclear power plant, I don't want to say that uh, this was the normal input and it didn't blow up. So nice, isn't it? This is empirically, I verified. It? I tried out some knobs and didn't blow out. It's a, it's, it's a safe thing. So wha when we think of explainability, we think of multiple things. We can think of uh, demonstration. We can think of the total process being simulated by someone, so someone being able to trace what happens what uh, in each and every element, or somewhat even someone even having the overview, like looking at the total blueprint and saying, okay, the total blueprint gives the power plant this and that functionality. And I think what the EU directive was, was aiming at is that at certain levels of sensitivity in society, you need certain levels of explainability. I think from the marketing perspective, maybe it's not that life-threatening, so maybe the level of explanation is demonstration enough. I don't think that you are just having to prove yourself logically or like from an analytic point of view, because oh, why not? Well, why, why should you? From a cancer diagnosis, now that's another thing. 
So I think what we really have to focus on in detail is for which type of task, what, are, what is our expectation? Do I expect something to be well reasonably acting or do I expect guarantees that it acts, acts like this and it's not, not always true for certain things. So we should try to sub, sub class the problems into sensitive problems or not so sensitive problems because I think that enables even the legislation a bit more since objectively uh, judging that someone is li liable for something is a very complicated legislative process so you need these guarantees in certain cases but not in others. But, but coming, coming back to the overall theme here, we have now talked about the explainability and accountability of, of algorithms and, and that large firms are more and more uh, covering uh, or getting a, a huge competitive advantage with these increasing network effects that we, we have been described uh, to by you. Um, would you. Would you say that it's necessary for policy here to really have a strict guideline to prevent the the inequality to arise from a fact like um, if if things are inexplicable yeah and we don't understand algorithms the power moves to some particular parts of the market and they will reap all the benefits and others will get nothing well I think uh, again it's a it's a very w we think that we culturally can agree in general that what is the right approach in this but I think I, I t all in all see th uh, see three types of approaches one of my good friends is trying to shape the Hungarian uh, governmental strategy towards AI so he did a big survey on on what kind of approaches are there and I think there are these is generally three types of, of notions of what for example social good is our notion is that that we should we should really guarantee with some legislative procedures that people are not being harmed. The the less uh, well defined version is maybe the U.S. version, where people get harmed, they sue each other, and after a decent amount of suing back and forth, we will just figure out what to do with these many sues, and then it gets gets into a law. That's kind of the post post facto. Well, let them figure out. Like the first 200 dies, and then after we just figure it out, type of thing. And there is, I think, even the Chinese version where they said that we we already know that a priori the 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 benefit of society is, is overruling the individual's benefit. So we do, we just don't care about the individual perspective because we just know, since from cultural perspective, we accept that there is this overarching theme of the social structures have to be enforced and then we just enforce it. So I think when we think about how to handle, for example, the, this phenomenon of, of, uh, of certain players acquiring more potential, whether it be political potential of capital, in the classical sense or data capital in the not that s classical sense we will very strongly re rely on our guiding notions culturally i okay, think so so you basically say it's always a trade off between yeah. on the one hand productivity growth and and for politics to say we have to intervene and do something to reduce inequality well i think uh, europeans we will try to legislate the us people will try to sue and the chinese <laughs> people will try to govern and and we will just try all, all of these things and maybe some of the combinations <laughs> will help uh, nina do you agree with that statement <laughs> you're laughing <laughs> um, uh, yes but on a broader scale i think what will help us is diversity and diversity of offers diversity of legislative frameworks and just accept that there will be no one solution to the trolley problem, there will be no one AI framework that will save us all, and there will be no one company uh, that, that strokes an evil cat. Um, we have to live with different approaches to the subject, and I think as long as, as there is no monopoly, as long as we can freely choose which one to follow, I think we're good. You wanted to answer to that, I saw? Well, <coughs> inequality, uh, is a matter of uh, politics, of social rules, of law. But I think there is something behind which is what you talked about, ethics. We have, until now, we are living on the ethics of religions. Be it our Christian religion or you did Buddha religion or so. But I'm deeply convinced this is religion's uh, ethics is outmoded, 
old fashioned, it doesn't apply anymore. We should find some way of establishing a modernized ethics on the basis of these uh, things, but and then questions like inequalities and so forth would be a, uh, an answer out of such a basic ethical judgment. Yeah, I, I saw that my colleague sneaked up on me here, and uh, I mean, I could go on with this discussion. I wrote down so many different questions I still had for all of you, and I hope that we can continue this discussion over of another Epler. I mean, you, you didn't open it, even though uh, encouraged next time, maybe. Um, <laughs> Maybe one, one last sentence from, from all of you to, to give an answer to the question. Would you say, Anita, that AI will exacerbate income inequality? In one sentence, please. Not if we do it right. Okay. Um, I think Professor Bibel is right now filling his eyes water, but the app level is next to it. No, I don't think it's AI which exacerbated <laughs> it. Um, but it is the general politics which uh, does not follow suit the modern uh, modernization of our society. Levente? On a personal level, I think not so on a person's lives, but from an organizational or, or bigger entity, international level, I think yes. Peter, the startup. I think yes. And the conclusion here. IBM, what does IBM or what does you say, Dilek? It's the same, like Anita said, yeah? Not when we are doing it right, then it could be a benefit if we are targeting on the positive things of AI. Perfect conclusion. Thank you so much to all of my guests. Please give a warm <laughs> applause here. And of course, we prepared something for you in the sense of the Epla talk. We bought Epla glasses for you. You can refill it once we leave the stage here. Also for the startups. And also, of, oh, of course, I, I forgot. I hope that the other startups did not leave already because we also have the Epla glasses here. Uli, Uli is in a, in a, in a talk right now. Your Epla talk, please give again an applause to Uli. Come. Ah, I just learned that Florian already already left. Ah, perfect here. Yeah, and uh, of course Lea and Neval in general. Yeah, and uh, Florian has to get it when he comes back to the queue. I think tomorrow. And this was it for me. I hope you enjoyed the panel discussion as I did and hope to be able to welcome you for the next edition, as Alina said, in September. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Kevin, as well. Uh, great moderation. And of course, you're welcome to uh, stay for another cold drink, because I know you're all probably sweating. Um, and yeah, I hope you had fun, and I hope I see you at the next edition, and have a safe way home or a nice uh, drink. Thank you.